It was late June of 2005 in the Kunar province of Afghanistan, and four outnumbered U.S. Navy SEALs were pinned down, low on ammunition and without high ground advantage. As the seconds turned into minutes and the minutes into hours, the escape options began to run out. Over a hundred insurgents had steadily cornered them, and more enemy combatants were on their way. Team leader Michael Murphy realized that the only hope for survival was to call in a quick reaction force, and in a heroic move, he left the safety of his cover and went straight for a clearing in the mountain to contact friendly troops, completely exposing himself to enemy fire. All the four wounded operators could do was wait for friendly cavalry to arrive before it was too late. A high-value target. Operation Red Wings was a combined joint military operation to take place in the Pek district of the Kunar province of Afghanistan. The operation's objective was to locate an HVT, or high-value target, a ruthless insurgent that went by the name of Ahmad Shah and was responsible for the loss of many civilians and American servicemen, especially U.S. Marines. Shah, also known as Muhammad Ismail, was a versatile guerrilla fighter since he was a youngster. He grew up in the mountains of Kunar province and knew the region well enough, which helped him and his men move around quickly and stealthily. When American forces dared venture into his home turf, they played by Shah's rules. His guerrilla group was called the Mountain Tigers for a reason. Like the ancient mammal, they knew when and how to stalk their prey. As such, the U.S. troops had failed to capture him or neutralize his tigers. Shah was also communicating with the Taliban and other rebel groups that operated close to the Pakistani border, and his connections with other hostiles and the continuous acts of violence gave him increasing prominence. The U.S. armed forces had to do something radical to get rid of him. The Plan on June 27, 2005, an elite team of four United States Navy SEALs walked up the ramp of an MH-47 Chinook helicopter. They were heavily armed and had plenty of ammunition and supplies to live in the wilderness for several days. The SEAL Special Reconnaissance Team, or SR, comprised Lieutenant Michael Murphy and Petty Officers Second Class Marcus Luttrell, Matthew Axelson, and Danny Dietz. The men were part of Phase 1 of Operation Red Wings, as a reconnaissance force, their duty was to infiltrate the region where it was suspected that Shah was hiding and guide an action team towards the target. Phase 2 comprised the SEAL Direct Action Team. Under the guidance of the SR team, their task was to either capture or terminate Shah and his men. Once done, Phase 3 would be launched with the insertion of Marines and Afghan friendlies that would sweep through the nearby valleys to form an outer cordon and eliminate any insurgent resistance. Phase 4 then involved stabilizing the zone and providing medical needs to the local population, establishing schools, roads, and other urban necessities. Finally, Phase 5 was the exfiltration process. If enemy activity persisted, some Marines would remain in the area to safeguard the population. As the sun settled on the fateful evening of June 25th, the four SEALs left Bagram Air Base to begin Phase 1. Approaching the area, U.S. Army Captain Matt Brady was the pilot of the MH-47 Chinook helicopter that was tasked with inserting the SEAL Special Reconnaissance Team deep into enemy territory. Brady was part of the Army's elite 160th Special Operations Regiment, or SOAR, also known as the Night Stalkers. Their job was to quietly insert the SR team and follow up with a second SEAL team the following night. As the Chinook approached the valleys surrounding Kunar Province in the middle of the night, Another American helicopter followed them closely to perform decoy drops and confuse the enemy. They then approached the insertion zone, and the AC-130 providing overwatch radioed Brady to let him know they were leaving due to a mechanical failure. Although such a change of plans would usually mean an instant mission abortion, Captain Brady decided to carry on with his duty, believing that the AC-130 would be back in action in no time. The insertion zone was on a ridge line where it was impossible to land the four special operators. Consequently, the Chinook hovered over the landing zone and stayed above the canopy of the trees while the commandos prepared to drop using a fast rope. As the men started to jump, Captain Brady saw through his night vision goggles that numerous lights were dotting the mountains below, which was odd for such a quiet night. One of the four seals went down and disappeared into the bushes. 
Brady returned to Jalalabad to link up with a second group of SEALs and the Quick Reaction Force in case the reconnaissance team was compromised. Operation Compromised Once in the area of operations, Lieutenant Murphy got his men into formation and began to move across the landscape. After approaching a covered overwatch position, the four SEALs stumbled upon some local goat herders. From there on, the situation quickly escalated. The four men rounded up the goat herders while they thought of a solution, and they had an arduous debate about what to do. If they released them, the mission would be compromised, but shooting them was the only way the four SEALs could keep the element of surprise. After moments of tension, Lieutenant Murphy released the locals. Knowing that they were compromised, the four SEALs then retreated to a safe position from which they could repel an enemy attack. As expected, the Taliban showed in no time, and a furious firefight broke out between the four SEALs and over 50 armed combatants. Murphy, Dietz, Axelson, and Luttrell then engaged the enemy with pinpoint accuracy using their M4 rifles from concealed positions. However, their combined firepower was not enough to repel an enemy with the upper edge and knowledge of the battlefield, terrain advantage, and more importantly, the numbers. The SEALs were pushed deeper into a ravine and the insurgents began launching a series of coordinated attacks from three directions as they retreated. Although the Americans managed to take down over a dozen of them, the advance was persistent, and the SEALs attempted to reach the bottom of the mountain to get to safe ground, but there was no way out. Urgent Help Almost an hour into the fight, Dietz attempted to find open air to make a distress call, but he was shot in the hand when he tried to do it. When Murphy noticed that Dietz was wounded, he left his cover and wholly exposed himself to enemy fire while placing the distress call on open ground. While the enemy directed their AK-47 fire on him, he managed to establish contact with Bagram Air Base and requested immediate assistance. The situation was now out of control, and they needed all the help they could get. And they needed it fast. While making the call, Murphy was shot multiple times, including a lethal shot in the back that forced him to drop the transmitter but he held his ground and kept fighting. Severely wounded, Lieutenant Murphy limped back to his men and continued emptying magazine after magazine to contain the horde of insurgents that had surrounded them. The fate of the four hardened SEALs now rested on the shoulders of the operators from the Quick Reaction Force. Quick Reaction Force When the SR team contacted Bagram Air Base for immediate support, the men back on the base could not believe it. Captain Brady was baffled, but honoring his code, the Night Stalkers from the 160th got ready for direct insertion into the hot zone. Two Chinooks, codenamed Turbine 33 and Turbine 34, took off immediately. Each was carrying eight Navy SEALs and eight Night Stalkers. The Chinooks were assisted by Black Hawks and Cobras to neutralize the enemy while they landed. However, knowing that this formation would only slow them down, the Quick Reaction Force raced through the air to assist their brothers in arms. The main risk was getting shot down in the middle of a combat zone in plain daylight. Still, the men were committed to their objective and headed straight towards the last known location provided by Murphy. When Turbine 33 sighted a possible insertion zone in the area, it hovered down and lowered the ramp for the men to deploy. But a rocket-propelled grenade emerged from the tree line as the ramp came down and flew straight into the Chinook. The projectile exploded inside before any operator managed to leave the helicopter. The Chinook then went for a spin before crashing down right into the terrain below the mountain. Turbine 34 watched helplessly as the situation unfolded, but they were immediately ordered to get back to base. Most men did not want to leave, and one SEAL even threatened the pilots to get him down to help his four brothers, but there was nothing to do except follow the orders. The men then headed back to base to regroup and coordinate another offensive, as the combat zone was packed with enemies and it would take a more organized effort to break through. A desperate fight. The situation on the ground was desperate for the wounded Navy SEALs. They were pinned down, surrounded, and cornered. There was no way out, and ammunition was running short. Almost two hours into the firefight, against overwhelming odds, the area was surrounded by nearly 35 fallen insurgents. Dietz had perished bravely, firing at the enemy until his five wounds took their toll on his body, and Lieutenant Murphy was also gone after getting pinned down by the enemy. Axelson and Luttrell were hiding together inside a small hollow, and their last hope of survival was the Quick Reaction Force, but they did not know that they had returned to base. 
Both men only had enough ammunition for their pistols, but while firing at the insurgents, a grenade launcher hit near Luttrell and sent him down the mountain, leaving him unconscious. When he woke up, he realized he was on his own, and the enemy was furiously hunting him down. Dehydrated, with his legs wounded by bullets and shrapnel and three vertebrae cracked during the fall, Luttrell mustered all the strength he had left to make it out alive. He managed to evade the enemy for an entire day before stumbling upon a small village where the locals miraculously aided him. Luttrell was taken care of, fed, and given medical attention by the family of Mohammed Gulab for almost three days. The Pashtunwali villagers did not say anything when the Taliban showed up to reclaim Luttrell. Meanwhile, the villagers had sent a runner to the closest American base, and a few days later, a team of army rangers successfully extracted Luttrell. Legacy Operation Red Wings suffered the worst single-day losses since Operation Enduring Freedom began, and was one of the saddest days in Navy SEAL history after the loss of 19 men. The U.S. would launch Operation Red Wings two days later to recover the bodies of the fallen servicemen. Years after the operation, Marcus Luttrell would write the book Lone Survivor to tell how Operation Red Wings truly unfolded, and detail how the seasoned Navy SEALs had to deal with adversity from the first hours of the operation. Then, in October of 2007, Lieutenant Michael Murphy posthumously received the Medal of Honor, citing that, quote, by his selfless leadership, courageous actions, and extraordinary devotion to duty, Lieutenant Murphy reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Thank you for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And don't forget to hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest videos. Also, let us know what you think of this operation and the brave actions of SEAL Team 10. Stay tuned.